I look at all of you, and I know that you all, every one of you has your own lives, your own stories. Today, I want you to kind of look at your own lives as if they are books, and that we're in the process of writing our next chapters, and probably dreaming of our future ones. I'm going to talk about a life lived differently, and through this, through this adventure, I've climbed mountains, and I may be talking about these summits, but there's always the same journey to these summits. There's different challenges, different rewards, but in the end, it's the same endpoint. And I think we're all the same, is we're all looking for happiness and fulfillment. When I was a young boy, I read a lot of fantasy books. I loved the hero's narrative. I just, there was something about a life lived with, like that. The, the challenges were so much. It, I really just loved the hero. I loved the way that they were trained, they had mentors, and eventually they t went out and tested their mettle. And I kind of looked around the world around me and I knew that I couldn't find my quests. I tried to follow the normal path through university, tried to please my parents, but yet it wasn't really working for me. I kind of ended up rock climbing. And thankfully through rock climbing, I discovered this sport where you really had to learn to trust in yourself and believe, otherwise you could fall. Because failure in this sport felt a lot more tangible than failing my first university course. I know, right? It really did. But failing my first university course was really important for me because it made me realize that I needed to step out and follow my dreams. And as scary as it was, I needed to venture out and search for my own challenges, my, my own future. And so I quit university. And I bought a Volks Volkswagen van, and I loaded it with climbing gear and kayak gear, and a really good friend. And we traveled around the western United States. And this was an incredible journey of self-discovery and a search for meaning. And I must say that I started to kind of doubt my convictions. I wasn't sure if I really could follow through on this life of adventure. And then one night, this old, weather wizened man joined us for drinking some wine. And we sat around the fire, and his, his voice was mesmerizing. His character was just captivating, and we drank wine, and eventually I told him about my story and how I really wanted my story to be different. I wanted it to be like a, a good book to write or to read. Anyhow, we finished the wine, four liters of Carlo Rossi, and he stood up, and as he was stumbling away, he looked back at me, and his red eyes pierced into my soul, and they said, you know, if I can teach you something tonight, Greg, I'll teach you to never give up. Never give up on your dreams. And those words have echoed through my life ever since. Never give up. And therein started a life of adventure. I started climbing mountains, ice, rock, everything I could. It was just this incredible life. And I was training so hard that I dislocated my shoulder. And in an instant, I had lost my passion and all its rewards. And my journal was full of doubts at that point. I was like, oh, God, I put all my life into this, and I've just lost it all. And I, I really didn't know where I was going to go with it. Um, luckily, I discovered, uh, discovered backcountry skiing, and it didn't require me to use my shoulder, which was really quite lucky because it had the same challenges and the same rewards that I was used to. And for those of you who don't know what backcountry skiing is, this is what it is. It's the act of cross-country skiing up mountains where you physically walk up, and then when you get to the top, your gear converts and you get to ski back down. Um, it was, you literally put these skins on, these animal pelts that stick to your skins, and as, as you glide up, and then you get to the top, and you pull them off, as I'm doing here, and then you get to ski down. And what's so incredible about this sport is it's all about personal judgment. You balance the avalanche hazard, the weather, the mountains you're in, and also human motivations. And you balance all these things, and then you come to a decision and this decision, literally, the lives of yourself and your friends hangs on that decision. It's also really fun. But yeah, all of a sudden, much like the heroes in my journeys, I found these quests, I found these mountains and these endurance challenges, and I, I found some mentors. And these mentors, they taught me how to, how to listen to the mountains and how to learn and stay safe. And I'd really, I was really excited because I had found my arena. I had found my quests, and I was just so excited. And right off the bat, I started to look at myself, and I was like, okay, what is my personal potential in a day? What is my personal potential? And I started, the, at the time, I did 5,000 vertical feet, and then I did 10,000 feet, and then the next year, I did 20,000 feet and 30,000 feet. I know these numbers don't mean anything. We'll get to that in a second. And I eventually, I did 40,000 feet of climbing up and down in 20 hours. And this was incredible. I must say I had a desire to prove myself. I just needed to show my brothers and the world that I was special. 
Um, because I, I was a ski bum, but I didn't want to be labeled as a ski bum because a ski bum is like a listless life just skiing and doing nothing else. And that's not what I wanted. I wanted an exceptional life, and I wanted everyone to know it. And these challenges kind of started proving that to me. And I have to say that setting these records, and it gave me this glory, and this glory of the little insecure boy inside of me loved it, and it started to make me feel special. And what I kind of learned along these challenges is I had learned a mantra, a personal mantra, and it's called breathe and believe. And I was actually whispering it to myself on the way out here. Breathe and believe. And it seems quite simple. Breathing is quite easy, right? But breathing in this situation, it's about relaxing. Because I know that if I relax and I don't stress out, I will be better off in overcoming all these obstacles. So breathe. And then believing, believing's an interesting one because it's a bit more complex. It's really hard to believe in yourself unless you've put in all the effort to get to that point. And to really believe, you have to be dedicated to something and you have to put in hours and hours, maybe 10,000 hours, to finally get to a point where you can firmly believe in yourself. And I had taken off all the layers. In these 20-hour days, you peel back all the layers to the little person inside of me, and I'd learned that I could trust him to dig deep and to push through these barriers. And so... What I ended up doing is I got, finally got invited to Colorado to set this new record of trying to ski, climb and ski 50,000 feet in a day. And I was up there hiking all day, back and forth, and at about 17 hours, Jimmy Faust caught up to me. And we joined together, and for the next seven hours, we set a new world record of 50,500 feet in 24 hours. So, like I said, what is that? Maybe, maybe the next time you're on a flight, you can look out the window, and most airplanes fly at 35,000 feet. So while you're out there, you can, while you're in the plane, look out and think, okay, I could hike up to here, ski back down, and then hike halfway back up. It's quite a number. Or maybe you could think that I climbed and skied, or I hiked 3,500 stories in a building. This is kind of the number, if that kind of gives you some context. But basically, the main idea behind it all is that I was pushing and digging deep and trying to find my own personal potential. And I think that's what it's all about in the chapters of your life. It's like looking and trying to figure out what you want to do and maximize who you are. So this was a lead up to a year where I decided to figure out what my personal potential was in a year, not a day. And I, I started off on January 1st, 2010 with this goal of climbing and skiing 2 million feet. And like all challenges, this, this is a big goal, but I broke it down into daily challenges. And each day I had to try to climb 5,500 feet or a vertical mile. Each day I would go out there, and throughout the whole entire year, I had this obsession and this goal. I kept looking at my watch and watching the numbers and working towards that goal. I climbed and skied in Canada and the U.S. I went down to Chile and Argentina. And then over the course of the year, I climbed and skied 77 different mountains. And I skied first ascents, and really, in the end, I just invested so much energy. And I actually, I didn't realize how much emotional involvement I put in this goal, because on the final day, December 30th, I was climbing up the slope, and finally, as I was getting close to the top, I had this incredible emotional well-being and this emotional rise-up that I didn't even know was coming. <laughs> so are you there? Yeah, there she is. Yeah! yeah. Woo! <laughs> Whoa, I guess I am going to get emotional. <laughs> Holy shit. You're a nutbag. You're you're crazy. Yeah. Holy shit. One year. Oh. No. Yeah, Don got me started back there. <laughs> we were talking about it. Wow. Well, what better place to finish it off than Rogers Pass? With friends and family right. for sure. Yeah, I didn't realize how much I'd put into that. I had an entire year of doubt. I had, the whole year, I was looking at that little number and building it and doubting it the whole time. And then I'd spent actually 10 years training for it physically and mentally, and then finally achieving it was this incredible emotional thing. And I've gained so much confidence from that that it's echoed in my life ever since. And I encourage you to follow your dreams and look for those things that will give you that extra confidence because you know you followed your dreams. So on this high... I, I kept doing adventures, and then I'm going to fast forward to 2014. In 2014, I was on my way to Pakistan, 
And as I left my house, I had this kind of weird fear inside of me when I was saying goodbye to my family. And this isn't that usual. But I just finished the biggest month of my life. I'd climbed and skied 330,000 feet. And then I got certified by the Association of Canadian Mountain Guides, and they'd certified me. So there I was. I was like the fittest I'd ever been. And then I was certified in my mountain sense. So I knew what I was doing, and I was fitter than ever, anybody. Yeah, I just think that you got to hit live a life where every once in a while you're just like, you give it your all, and then you complete something, and yeah, it feels good. <laughs> on this high, I traveled down to Pakistan. We got there, and we were going to warm up on this 20,000-foot peak, and I was full of overconfidence. I definitely, at a point, there was nobody telling me to slow down. I just was, like, so full of myself and my skills. And I went off to ski this slope. What do you, what do you think about this place so far? Well, today I'm psyched. We're going out skiing. And there's a little bit of fluffy powder. Look at this. Look at this. Himalayan powder waiting for us. I'm psyched. And that thing is wicked looking. As you can see, I was so full of overconfidence and love for life that I, I was a little blinded. And then we're about to go to ski into this line and I wanted some hero footage for the video. I wanted to look like a hero, like those heroes in all my stories. So without, without enough self-analysis, too much overconfidence, I went and skied into this line. Skied down, looking like a hero, bam. I jumped from slab to slab, just trying to stay calm and breathing, believing that I could get through. And then soon enough, I was hit. And like a doll in a dryer, I was tumbled down, tumbled, tumbled for thousands of feet. Watch, watch, watch. Struggling to remember which way was up, I was flipped over and over and over, and I swam towards the surface. Do you see him, Bjarna? As it slowed down, I was able to swim towards the surface and I was kind of frozen there like Han Solo, but luckily my arms and my, my head were out. I had a bit of snow in my mouth, so I pulled that out and I started breathing again. And I yelled to my friends, I'm okay, I'm okay, because I kind of thought I was. But as I'd been coming down, there'd been this flash of light and I didn't know what, but I knew something bad had happened. But I lay there and they came down and as they were digging me out, I was like, oh, I think I'm okay. To have survived that is super lucky. And I think I'm okay but I was kind of confused because I could see the sole of my foot. And then they were dig digging me out, and as they dug me out, it eventually it just flopped down. This leg was shattered and broken. Luckily, I was calm and collected, and we worked together to splint my leg and just kind of make sure I survived that moment. At this point, I was still kind of cavalier. I was like, oh, I'm going to be rescued in an hour, two hours. That's how quick we get rescued in North America. Yeah, here are the consequences. <laughs> a really sore shoulder and a broken leg and, you know, almost death, really. But to live a life, like, life is so fleeting. You know, it could come and go and nothing can happen in your entire life where you can live one to the limit and, and have shit like this happen. But... This, compared to all the great things that have happened, is minuscule, so minuscule. It's been so many, many moments. Like I said, I was quite calm at that point because I assumed rescue was coming soon. But then we quickly realized that rescue wasn't going to happen. And then Bjarne dug a snow cave, and we kind of got me in there. And then for the rest of that whole night, I lay there, breathing and believing. I was wiggling my toes to keep them from freezing and getting frostbite and just accepting what had happened and never really giving up. That was the longest night of my life. Just, I've got this, I've got this. The next morning we woke up, and it was a six-hour toboggan ride down the mountainside. I was sitting there broken the whole time. And eventually, finally, the helicopter came in and picked me up. At that moment, finally, I was able to let all the walls down and, and start crying, because I had survived. I just spent 23 hours stressing about surviving, and I knew that I was finally safe. So what happened after that is I spent six months healing this broken leg on my couch. And while I was sitting there, I was really looking at my life and looking at my life like it's a book and the chapters and like recognizing that it had been an incredible life up till then. I'd, I'd pushed my potential, I'd set limits, and it was really inspiring to me and others, but I realized there was a selfishness to it and that there weren't really any chapters about giving back. And lying there, I was like, oh, I wonder what. I, really, I was really questioning who Greg Hill is or was. Because at that point, I didn't know if I was gonna, my leg was going to heal and if I was going to overcome it and become the endurance adventure I'd been. 
And I really didn't know what else there was in my life, and I wanted to figure out something that had more meaning. So sitting there, I really, really looked at myself. And I looked at my kids. And I recognized that one of the ways I could change my, my life was to become a little bit more environmentally responsible. That as someone who got so much rewards from nature, I got so much back that I really was killing it with my actions. I had a large F-350, a snowmobile, a heli skied, I was jet setting across the world for all my adventures. So really, if I, as, as someone who got so much back from nature, wasn't ready to be a steward for it, who could? So up to that point, I'd been really scared about actually being environmentally responsible because, well, because we know that social media will attack you if you're not perfect, and, and I was just scared, scared to take those steps because I knew I was not perfect. But I decided to not let perfection get in the way of progress, and I started taking small steps. And like all my challenges, it's just small steps after small steps lead to great things, and I started to look at what the first steps could be. And my brother Graham Hill, he did a TED talk on weekday vegetarianism and proved how it's better for the environment and for your own health. So that was one of my first steps. It was quite easy. It's become a habit and something I really enjoy. And then I did a carbon calculation, and I was driving this big truck on the left, the F-350, and I realized that accessing all my adventures, I was using so many fossil fuels that my carbon footprint was massive. And so I looked at that, and I was like, okay, what could I do? And at the time, in 2016, there was, you know, the electric cars were used for commuting, but they really, that's all people thought they were for. And I thought, if I could prove to the world that I could live a life of adventure in my little electric car and summit 100 summits along the way, that maybe I could help change people's minds and electric cars would become more popular. So that year I summited, or that couple of years, I summited and climbed over 100 mountains electrically and human-powered and created this movie called Electric Greg and also got the nickname from it, which is pretty awesome. So I'm Electric Greg in case you ever want to ask me my nickname. But I really, it was about showing people that there's a different way and we all have to look at ourselves and at the world and recognize that there's different ways to do things. And then after that, I started looking at other things I could do, and one of the things I've, I could do to lighten my footprint was possibly grow more vegetables at home. So I tripled my garden, and every year I get a lot of satisfaction from growing all this food at home and be more sustainable. And it's really exciting when you eat these tomatoes and these cucumbers. There's something special about knowing you just grew your own food. And then, so all this is individual changes, but then I was like, what else could I do? And the, the great thing about this world is that there's a lot of other people out there to help you make changes. And so I helped, I helped start the nonprofit Protect Our Winters Canada, which echoes the work that Protect Our Winters does in the USA. And what they're doing is they're uniting the outdoor community to advocate for policy solutions to climate change. And this felt really good in adding my voice to this movement. Because many of us making small changes is far better than a few of us making big changes and being perfect. So here I am now looking at my life and my last chapters, and you know, I have to say, I'm, I'm feeling better about them. I feel pretty good. I feel like I'm, I've got a chapter that's about giving back. And, you know, they're all, they don't always work. I've got some habits that have, become, that have worked and others that haven't, and that's fine. And the whole idea is just to kind of keep looking for solutions to lighten my footprint. And so, I guess what I'm asking you guys today is if someone were to read your book, your chapters, what would you want the next chapters to say? You know, if, what would you want your legacy to be if someone could read your book? And I think that's really important for all of us because we are all leaving these stories behind for our kids, for our family. And what would you want yours to say? You know, we all have these dreams, and it's really scary following our dreams. I can tell you that when I was trying to do those, leave university, my parents were upset, but I knew that if I worked really hard and that I'd eventually achieve great things. So I wasn't too scared, but I was, yes, okay, I lie, I was scared. But you guys are probably all scared too of following your dreams. And, and that's fine, but let's all embrace this together, accept our fears, and move forward. I'd like to say thank you for being a part of my story today. And thank you for letting me be a part of yours. I hope that we can all look towards the future and know that working together, we can make it a better place. That all of our little efforts, our little impacts, add to big change. So let's breathe and believe in a better future. 
Never, oh, sorry, always look up. Never give up, and we can make the world a better place. Thank you.